reach, we all reach the future at the same time. But it is how we prepare for it. It is how we prepare for that future. We must be prepared. We must engage in a system of functional unity. Functional unity where we will build something. Not just organizational unity or uh, operational unity where we, we commit ourselves to the theory of unity and the concept of unity. We must engage in a system. A system that the world has not yet known. We have a system that we're working on called functional unity. Where we have a council of elders. We have unity builders. We have a, a, a center, and we, 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 we're going to establish centers all over the country that can, that can receive information and then have that information disseminated among the masses of people so that we will be sharp and on point and doing our homework about the issues and the, and, and the potential resolutions to the issues that we continue to face, what we call the vestiges of slavery. Because it's still, we still experience these things right today. We are not whole. We are not whole and we need a system that can tie us all together under, no matter what that spirituality or that walk of life um, that you are walking on, um, that, that, you know, that you're experiencing, no matter what that is. We still have brothers and sisters who are not here and we need to be that, that, that army. My daughter was saying, Mama, we don't have an army. We need an army. We need an army. If that army is to educate people, we got to go to the projects, what's left of them. We got to go out to our brothers and sisters. You are really the choir. Every, most every face that I see in here is probably got about 10 or more things on your plate. But as I tell my brother, my wooly from the scriptures, Minister Akbar, is it says, my cup runneth over, right? But after your cup runneth over, the next passage is surely goodness and mercy shall follow you. So no matter how much task we have on our plate, we can do it. Queen Mother said there's no success without successes. So that means we got to be preparing our young people to take the fall, to take the, to take the baton. But you know what I tell them? You got to be back there to get it. If we don't have no young people behind us, they can't get the baton. They're not there. And so we keep aging and aging and aging and aging. So I tell you, my brothers and sisters, it is unity. It is unity that we must strengthen. Because reparations is not going to go away. We have blocked this, pushed this forward for the last 15 years. We can't wait on them crackers to tell us when and, and how and what. If we had waited on them, we'd have never heard the issue of reparations ever again. So it's in the spirit of Cali House. Yes, that's right. In the spirit of Harriet Tubman, where we have to run away and do the wrong thing sometimes. Right. I don't mean wrong uh, in terms of, of uh, right and wrong or good and bad, but I'm saying we, we have to, still in a way as, as an enslaved African was against the law. Well, it was against their law. So we got to establish black law. We have to establish our own standards and our own means of making that transformation from the European standards to the African standard. And then the Africans, they got to come for us. The Africans must come here for us as well. We don't hear enough about the justice that we're demanding and the injustice that took place from the African brothers and sisters in our behalf. Right. So we have to hear about that. So again, I can't say this enough. It is about establishing a system that we agree upon, whether that's under the standards of Ma'at, or whether that's under the standards of unity, criticism, unity, or as my sister Falani brought up, Palava. We have to get each other's backs. Yes, yes. 
And that is what the reparations movement is about. We're getting the backs of our ancestors. We may not ever see it. And some people say that the United States don't even have enough to share with us. But what I say is they can go down to Fort Knox and make us all the money that we're going to need to do whatever we're going to need. $777 trillion is what the brothers and sisters came up with in, in Ghana in uh, 2000. Was that 2000, Jamoke? 1999. 1999. It sounds about right. I believe we can use whatever. But it's not only money, it's land, it's technology, it's education, it is, it's our programs, it's the continuation of our hopes and our dreams. We just have to pull together a unified plan of action to do that. So can we get a unified plan of action from this summit, my brothers and sisters? Can we get a unified plan of action? Action means we got to, you know, I was telling my, my son earlier that to try, this is trying, mm -hmm. trying. But to strive, you put one foot in front of the other and then you reach your destination or you reach your resolution. So we got to do more than try, we got to strive. Every day, every day we got to do something for our struggle. Some months ago I pulled together an hour a week campaign. Now, we give, we give the system, the U.S. system, 40 hours a week with no question. 40 hours a week with no question. So can we give our, our, our struggle for repair for our people? I don't care what that struggle will be, what it looks like. If it's repair for our people, it's got to be good for our people, our families, our, our, uh, our nation. So let's at least do two hours a week. Go and, and, uh, and sacrifice some time with the Million More Movement. Two hours a week. Because by the end of that, of that year, that's uh, 100, 110 hours that you had put into the struggle for the repair of your people. I was calling it an hour a week campaign, but now let's put two hours a week so we can step it up a little bit. Yes. Go to the Hebrew Israelites. Go to in Cobra. Yes. What's that um, address, Brother Mawuli? And when is the next meeting, Brother Mawuli? Every Sunday at 4.30. All right. So can we come up with a unified plan of action? I just want to have one last thing, Brother, and thank you for allowing us this opportunity. I want to thank um, you and all of your committee, because the Brother is African now, whenever I sing. <laughs> I want to give us a special, special, special um, greeting to my sisters, in Rastafari, we're coming to Spelman. Every year we give thanks for our, our, our Omega, our Alpha and our Omega, the one who have paved the way for us. And so the Rastafari women will be having a conference here at Spelman March 23rd through the 26th. Please come and sistership with us and brothership with us and be one on this mission for a unified plan of action. Don't uh, ignore us because of the reputation that the U.S. government has put on Rastafari. Right. It says, blessed are the pure in heart. So history would tell us if we were right or wrong in whatever we're doing. Give thanks and praise. Hotel, brothers and sisters. Hotel. How y'all doing? Great. Well, I guess they saved the best for last. But, uh, <laughs> but um, thank you, Brother Minnelli. Uh, my name is Brother Carswell, and I represent the Embassy. And um, we're an organization here in Atlanta uh, dedicated to bringing back the science. Somebody say science. Science. Because as a people, we have forgotten the science of economics. Let me say that again. We have forgotten the science of economics. Elijah Muhammad, one of the most profound leaders of the 20th century, said that it was three things that the Caucasian didn't teach us. The science of mating, science of warfare, and the science of business. 
And as a people, we have forgotten the science of economics that was laid down to us by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, Marcus Garvey, and all those who started Pan-Africanism. Are y'all with me? The word economics is a Greek word that means to have your house in order. That's what it means. It means house order. And right now, black people in the world, our economic houses are not in order. Why? Because we refuse to learn the systems that govern economics. And at the embassy, what we're about, I've I heard a lot today about, you know, people have tossed around the Berlin Conference of 1885. And at the Berlin Conference, they gave control of America over to the Rockefellers. They gave control of Australia and Africa over to the Oppenheimers, and Europe was given to the Rothschilds. Now, the person who started the Rothschild clan was Mayor Amstel, way back in the 1700s. And he said that they would control two things. This talking about the Jews. He said they would control the flow of information and the flow of currency. Are y'all with me? And that, that's why we have to have a media outlet in the Pan-African community. The reason why hip hop right now is a three billion dollar a year industry that is controlled by the way by the Zionist Jews <laughs> is because of the media. Are y'all with me? And the images, I'm, I'm gonna go back to what the last poet said. The last poet said that niggas are afraid of revolution. Malcolm X said it this way. He said that the only bloodless revolution is the Negro revolution. And today, you know, we're doing a lot of talking and a lot of meetings and stuff like this, but there's no change going on because that's all revolution is. It's mighty quiet. Yes. Because on the economic forefront here in Atlanta, Georgia, somebody say Atlanta. Atlanta. And when I say we forgot the science, Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm came to this area back in 1960. Because Atlanta is the lower Egypt of the West. Yeah, y'all quiet. This is the lower Egypt of the West. See, back when the founding fathers established this country, first of all, they didn't tell us that there were five black presidents before George Washington. And that the name, the original name of Washington, D.C. was Little Egypt, or Little Kim. It's quiet. And so that's why now in Atlanta that was named after Atlantis. Are y'all with me? That's why we have 13 Fortune 500 corporations here, the number 13. Because we've been talking about going back to Africa, and we've got to get into the prophecy and the science of, of, of Joseph in the Bible. When it says Joseph was sold into slavery, and when he was sold into slavery, he became a ruler in Egypt. And getting back to the science of economics, and I know, because Brother Menelik only gave me five minutes, but when, when Ramesses II conquered, when he won the Battle of Kadesh, because he was a general at that time, and that catapulted and made him pharaoh. But when he won the battle at Kadesh, one of the spoils of war, the, the, because they fought the Hittites, um, the, the daughter of the Hittite king was given to Ramesses um, um, as a form of doing the peace treaty. When she came to Kemet, these are the first words she said. She said that I have never been to a land where the poorest of the poor are wealthy. I don't think y'all heard that. Because a lot of times with Afrocentricity and Pan-Africanism, economics is a sidebar. Yeah. And that's the reason why we are not able to attract and to garner the minds of the young people. And, and, and I'm going to say this in closing. You know, in any revolutionary struggle, you have idealists and then you have gangsters. <laughs> che Guevara was an idealist. But Fidel Castro was a gangster. That's why he's still living. Malcolm X was an idealist, but Louis Louis Farrakhan is a gangster. Uh-oh. Are y'all with me? And we have a gangster in the White House right here named George Bush. And, and, and right now, we're on, the, we're on the, the final frontier, which is economics. And I, I, I'm going to quote what the Buddhists say. The Buddhists say that in order to defeat the devil, you must become the devil. Let me say that again. In order to defeat the enemy, you must become like the enemy. And how as we as black people, we 
you're talking about the thief, this system, because J. Edgar Hoover said in 1968, dealing with you, um, eugenics, he said there will never be another black messiah unless we create it. Are y'all with me? What was he saying on the night of April 3rd when they plotted to assassinate Dr. Martin Luther King? Who at the same time said that he had been to the mountaintop and he knew he was not going to get there with us. What J. Edgar Hoover was saying because he said that we have to stop the rise of a what? A black messiah. <laughs> and that messiah is going to come out of Atlanta, Georgia. Quiet. Why Atlanta? <laughs> Because everything starts here first. And dealing with the science and the astrology and the, and the metaphysicality of Atlanta, we have forgot the science as a people because they rule the world based on the science that we gave them. That's right. Are y'all with me? Every president since Roosevelt has at least three psychics and astrologers on staff. Are y'all quiet? The only one who did was Ronald Reagan, and when he got shot, what did Nancy do? Call this problem. Huh? She went and found that psychic, Gene Dixon. How y'all with me? But I know my time is up. But I just want to tell you, brothers and sisters, it's time for the revolution. Are y'all ready for the revolution? It's based on the story says that one day, my mama and mom said to the little babies, don't leave this nest. It's a mean world out there with all kind of muscles that's waiting to eat you up. So don't leave this nest. And the little baby said, okay, mommy. Okay, mommy, what's that, mommy? What's that, what's that, mommy? And the mom, mommy went out and work and brought back things for the nest. And she did this day after day after day after day. When those babies grew old and got bolder, one day when the mama was gone, what do you think the babies did? They left that nest. But you know what? Mommy was right. There was a monster out there waiting on him. And this monster had some long, scraggly teeth. He had some real sharp claws. And he made a mean, horrible, frightening sound that went something like, And that monster ran those little babies up into a corner and was licking his lips and rubbing his paws because he knew he was about to have some mice for lunch. But that's when the mummy got back. And the mommy saw that monster about to eat her babies. She dropped the thing she had in her hand. She ran up behind it, and this is what she said. Roo, 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 roo. And the monster ran off without looking back. 
when the mommy got the children back into the nest, the children said, Mommy, 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 what happened, Mommy? What happened? And the mother looked at the children and she said, Children, you see that? It never hurts to know a second language. <laughs> Thank you. about us. Brother Ibrahim Contel from Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone. Um, first of all, before I say anything, I want to thank um, the Almighty Lord that brings us together here yeah. and the organizers of this program. Yeah. You know, I've learned a lot today um, since this morning and I want to you know, thank them and let's get the courage and determination. Um, I'm here on behalf of the All People Congress, which um, is a political party in Sierra Leone and is the opposition party in Sierra Leone. Uh, some of you that know about Sierra Leone can know about the APC. But my own reason here is to introduce the APC and uh, the coming election in 2007. Um, some of the panelists said here, we don't need the white people to go to Africa to tell us how we can do our election or how we can conduct our government. You know, we are enough, you know, to do that. And we are educated. We get a lot of people all over the continent that is well educated and can do um, a better thing that the white people can do. I'm not trying to um, discredit them. But I believe, you know, with all my heart that we are far better than them, you know, because yeah. Yeah. Um, we, if we're talking about civilization, we're talking about democracy, I mean, it's, it's the black people, you know, and uh, I can say some people can believe it, but some historic people even saying Jesus Christ is a black man. That's right. And a lot of panelists talk about the first president in America being a black. And also, they can tell us everything. Just like another panelist said, we need to go to Africa. See, what they tell you here and what is there is different. And the All People Congress in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone have been through a war over 10 years, a lot of atrocity. And now the people are calling for change. Not only change in Sierra Leone, but change in the continent. And also, that is why group like this today, you know, it's good. And a lot of things that have been discussed here today, please, let's don't say, let's work on it. Let's work on it. And, and I believe, as a Sierra Leonean, as an African, we can do it. If the continent come together with all we have, we don't need their help. See, all we need is the mind of the people of Africa. Once we get that one mind, we have that trust, and we all come together, we can do it. And that is all the ABC is about. It's about change. And the voice of Sierra Leone is asking, you know, the continent to support the country, not to support a political party, but to make sure that in 2007 May, the coming election, whatever group is here, to give a support, to go there, to see the ground, to make sure, to put pressure in the, the, the government that is there, to make sure everything is done right, the voice of the people in order to be heard. So if I'm here today, 
I'm here to introduce the APC to you and to ask everybody here and we invite you in Sierra Leone and please wherever we discuss here, let's work on it, let's trust each other, let's make the connection in Africa to African countries, let's make the connection, let's go together and another brother talk about being in relationship to God. He is the spirit being, he can go where we can go. So my time is off and I thank you very much and thank you. Thank you, Brother Ibrahim. Okay. Thank you all for hanging in there. It's your time. Y'all can see we have a lot of panelists. So I'm going to ask everybody to be mindful, to be honest, to be true, and to be respectful to the time that you take here and make sure that with the time that you take, you're giving as much as you can. So the way, yeah. So here's how we're gonna do it. You're gonna get a minute or less to ask your question or make your comment. And I love you. Trust me, feel it. I love you, but I love everybody else too. So when I say it's time, that means it's your time. Because now it's somebody else's time, okay? And similar to that, similar to that, and I'm gonna tell you, in organizing, that's one of the things we've had to learn. You know, we all got a story to tell, but everybody's story is as valuable as the next person. And so you got to give equal time so you have equal value. Word. Okay. So we're going to try and do the same with our, oh Lord, give thanks, amazing panel of speakers where we'll give you a couple to a few minutes to respond. And sometimes we may not have time for everybody to answer every question, but if you're the one with the burning response or even a burning question for the audience, then please use that time. What I will do in honor and respect is no matter what your first question is, my sister Mama Swanston will have the floor. Okay? So, be recognized before you speak. My brother here will bring you the mic because we only have one and we are going to go right up until about seven o'clock. Okay, what we're going to say is for the first set of folks that we have questions for, I see a hand here, I see a hand here, I see one, two, three, four, five. Would you all just come right down here into this aisle and form a line so we can see how much multi-logging we have to do in the next hour? All right. And uh, on both ways, give your name when you speak. Okay. <laughs> My name is Teresa Ricks, and I am a student here at Clarkland University. And I'm also <laughs> the Student Government Association Graduate Vice President and the co-chair for female co-chair here for the Cobra chapter on Clarkland's campus. <laughs> My question is to the ambassador. Since we do have a chapter of NAACP on our campus. I want to know as students what we can do that can assist Zimbabwe in your plight. Oh, your assistance to Zimbabwe. Yes, the what students, you, what can we do? What you can do, oh that's critically important. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. I'll, be very, I'll be very shocked. I know, the question went to the ambassador, but hold on a second. I really do y'all in honor and with respect. I'm not going to ask everybody's age, but I'm sure Mama Swanson has an elder voice on the panel if there is something that you can think of in response to that question, and then we'll pass that forward. Please, ma'am. What you can do and what every student should do, find out the kind of person you are. Find out what you have going for you. Find out what your parents were trying to tell you. Get a handle on that. And once you do that, you will see what you can do for you. But I'm going to let him tell you exactly.
exactly what he'd like you to do. It's always going to be some wisdom, no matter what. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's a wisdom of wisdom. But I'll be short, really. Since you know, you, the student's capacity to assist in a way, especially with situations in my way, is kind of limited, I should say. But however, they still can do something. We have the aid situation in the country. We have orphans in Zimbabwe. Students can come handy in their schools to organize themselves, raise some kind of charity, or um, adopt a school, or an orphanage, and assist in that way. It's perhaps this is, this is cognizant of the fact that the students' capacity to engage in bigger things perhaps might be demanding too much for the students. But they should be very conscious of what's happening in Zimbabwe. They must take interest of what's happening in Zimbabwe to Africans, to blacks in Zimbabwe, you know, and boost that in their own communities. They should commun communicate with, with other members, other students in their communities, conscientize themselves on, uh, 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 with what's happening in Zimbabwe. You know, that's critically important. Correct. You can contact me and we can work together. We can synchronize that. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Maude Robinson and I represent the Million Moore Movement here in Atlanta, the local Atlanta LOC. And I'm very glad to be here today. And uh, my questions, I have two and I'm not sure who I'm directing them to, but will we get information about um, trips to Africa where we can go in safe haven because that's part of my, you know, when we first got started with the minister in 95, uh, we had an economic group that we were looking to go to Africa and we had a lot of the African brothers, we had the conference, the Islamic with uh, Sister McKinney and all of those and we met here at the same site. And I went and got my, uh, my, uh, passport and everything and I just knew that it was going to be soon that I was going to be there and then things broke out and, and I got all nervous about going. Is there any plans on doing something <laughs> and letting the black people in America know where we can all get together and go there? And the other question is, um, is it, okay. okay. I'm holding the mic so I have the advantage. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I have the advantage of this. I think Minister Abba kind of uh, brought the message home when he did mention about trips to Africa. He has already succeeded in that. When my time was running out, <laughs> I, 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 I was going to talk about that when I said action now, you know. I told you that I'm working closely with uh, black farmers organization, black engineers, black doctors, and so on. It's because uh, we have that plan already. I'm working on that to bring about groups that are interested in investing in Zimbabwe. You know, we are inviting professionals, even non-professionals, people with their own money. I do tell you that the West is deploying in mass in Africa. They are deploying. Mugabe started something that they don't want to see. They are deploying to strengthen those institutions that are already white institutions that are already in control. You see? They are deploying. It's not just the military that they are deploying in Africa. Civilians. It's not about the peace corps you had coming there. That they are penetrating into African systems. Pouring money. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything, unless I will be shown the next plane to Africa when I go back to yeah. Yes, but uh, I, I, you should take cognizance of this. This is why I was saying, it is now, not tomorrow. Maybe somebody has to take this message. My, yeah. uh, since the Honorable has already said everything, I would like to say to you, my sister, there is Reverend Danjabu right there. He organizes trips to Africa, so he can help you with that. 
Thank you. Yes, um, two things I'd like to say on trips to Africa very briefly. Number one, the uh, European airlines and even world airlines that owns North American airlines that's flying to Ghana once a week during the summer, they're going to do it twice a week. They overcharge black people to go to Africa. And what we need to do, we can organize trips for you, sister. You know, that's what I do. I take people to Africa, not just commercially, but as a passion. Uh, but I want to say this, that if we organize and we hammer these airlines, do you know that I can fly from Atlanta to Paris off-season for $298? But you try to, there's even off-season for Africa, Lufthansa out of the Atlanta market is the cheapest, $968 off-season. <laughs> During the season is sixteen to eighteen hundred dollars, and uh, so what we need to do is to show the racist policy against travel to Africa, and there's enough of us to make that kind of protest to go to Africa. We have to make some noise. Okay, thank you. Brother Frank, I think that one of the things we have to realize is that first tonight or this evening, both the uh, Nation of Islam and the uh, Hebrew Israelites have been able to lay out clearly what they have been doing. And it's surprising to a lot of people. And I think that we need to realize that uh, there are other people who are also doing things like that. For instance, I organized a fact-finding trip in 2002 to go to Zimbabwe to come back and do a film, you know, uh, was, you know, very, not the finest film, but information-wise, it was a very powerful film. And our uh, December 12th movement has been doing a series of films taking people out to Zimbabwe to come back and counter based on the fact that you were there. You know, many years ago, before 1968, when I first went out, uh, we were always debating about Africa in, in the streets, you know, African nationalists, the street speakers. And what happens, the Negroes would be, had the money, so they would go to Africa. And when they came back uh, and we tried to counter them, they would say, have you been to Africa? We call them the Bentus, <laughs> you know, because, but we realized that at the same time that it had an impact on people who were listening because they said, well, that's true, have you been there? So we started to be, go there the first time we went. Uh, we went with a situation where you could fly down, pay, select, pay later. Well, they found out that didn't work because we, we could fly down and we could pay them later. It ain't a refrigerator, it ain't a car, they can't repossess. But too many of us were doing that, so they, felt they took that away. But the fact is that you should, you should go. And what, one of the things you have to realize, too, is that we're trying to get involved in Africa. The uh, really interesting, uh, people should read uh, New Africa magazine. It's the best African magazine out there. But this issue particularly...